evening. Trust you're doing well. It's quiet. Hey. There. Good. Yes, my wife was talking about the COVID numbers. That's what it is. All right. Praise God. We're covered. All right? Yes, His Spirit covers us and protects us. We don't have to worry about what media says or doesn't say, what mass media is trying to tell us or not trying to tell us. We listen to the Word of God and His truth. That stands firm, right? And we're, by Jesus' blood, we are covered. Amen. Well, tonight we've got a wonderful psalm lined up, and that is Psalm 48. And I want to thank Harry and the team for singing Psalm 48 tonight. Now, it wasn't identified, but the minute we start reading, you'll, uh, you'll remember that if you don't know already. That uh, song that we sang, uh, I remember from the yesteryears, a great song that was there. I'm going to read just a few verses uh, from it. Please turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm 48. And I'm, I'm reading it from a, uh, the, the Christian's standard Bible. The Lord is great and highly praised. In the city of our God, his holy mountain rising splendidly is the joy of the whole earth. Mount Zion, the summit of Zaphon, is the city of our great king. God is known as a stronghold in its citadels. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, O Lord, for the time tonight to gather together to sing songs of praise and worship to our God. We thank you. So now, Lord, as we direct our attention uh, to your word, help me to speak your words. Help us to hear what your spirit's saying to us tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather in freedom. We pray a blessing on the emir, the crown prince. We pray, Lord, for the parliamentarians. Pray, Lord, for those governing that you have entrusted to govern this nation. Pray, Lord, that they can do it with diligence, truth, righteousness, and that we can continue to worship you in freedom. We thank you, Lord, for you are good. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the psalm starts off at uh, the beginning. Some, some translations will put it right, into, right away into verse 1. It says, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah. And so we ask, well, who are, who are these guys? Because we think most of, the, most of the psalms traditionally, we think, come from David. And then you get a number of these psalms like this. And if you have your Bibles open, you're going to turn back, just flip back a couple of pages and look at Psalm 42. 42 starts off with, for the choir director, a masculine of the sons of Korah. Uh, and then 44, for the choir director, a masculine of the sons of Korah. Then in 45, a masculine for the sons of Korah, uh, a love song for the choir director, according to the lilies. Interesting, these little bits of information, huh? Verse 46, for the choir director, a song to the sons of Korah, according to Elmoth. 47, for the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, and on and on. So there's a number of verse, uh, chapters here which identify that these songs are written, oh, these, these yeah, psalms are written many times as songs talked about this before and how the choir would then take it or the music, musically talented people would take these psalms, put them into music and then sing them. Now, something interesting that happens here, we know that uh, King David had uh, quite a, he was a, a singer and he had quite an, uh, a heart and a passion for singing. And uh, what he would do is he would take the sons of Korah, the descent, meaning the descendants of Korah uh, the, the, from the Levitical tribe, and he would actually employ uh, choirs to sing in, uh, at that time it would have been the, the tent. And his son uh, Solomon, when he built the temple, would actually have uh, choirs employed to sing. So when people enter into the gates, there would be singing going on. And um, we're blessed we get to come in here. And thank you, music team, for leading us. And, uh, and doing this, and this is exactly what they did back then. Led the congregation in the times of singing and praise. And so, so it is with a psalm that we have in front of us. It is also one of these that would be sung uh, publicly. Now, a little bit about the sons of Korah. 
what I find very interesting and which will help us uh, also understand this particular psalm is when we ask who are they, you can, you can note this in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 9 and, and then chapter 26. In these two chapters, it talks a little bit about the descendants of, of Korah and who they were and their uh, connection musically. Now, in particular, 2 Chronicles chapter 19, or chapter 20, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, this is a story of Jehoshaphat, a time when the enemies were coming against him, and they had come over from the east side, and they were coming past the Dead Sea. It's all flat land. It's in the valley there. And then they were in the strongholds of En Gedi, and uh, the, the word came to the king and said, we've got a bunch of uh, enemies who have al um, created an alliance against us. And uh, he, he's, he hears how many they are and how few they are, and he figures, we are in big trouble. And they were in trouble. I mean, mathematically, doing the odds, they were in big-time trouble. And so what happened is God gives them an answer, and it, it, a, a tremendous answer. I love it. But he doesn't, uh, he doesn't necessarily say what they want to hear. If you take a look at chapter 20, and... Um, well, starting with, for example, um, verse 15, he says, Listen carefully, all Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast number. For the battle is not yours, but God's. And it's like, okay, good. We can relax. It's God's battle, not ours. And while they're hearing that, they're looking at the size of the enemy and the puniness of themselves and thinking, <laughs> okay, God, you're going to do it. And probably in some of their minds, they're thinking, now, how fast can we run out of here? <laughs> how fast can we take off? And then he tells them something here. Uh, he says in verse 16, tomorrow, tomorrow. Sometimes that's a good word. If you're a good procrastinator, you love the word tomorrow. Tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. Well, one of the problems with tomorrow is that there's a night between today and tomorrow. And, and, and these guys, the things that they saw, they saw vast armies. And they saw the smallness of themselves. And God says, tomorrow, go down against them. So that gives them a minimum of 12 hours to fight against fear. But it all, that's the negative side. It gives them also 12 hours to let their faith marinate, to let their faith increase. Tomorrow. Tomorrow go fight them or you'll go down against them. Verse 17 you do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of God. He is with you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Okay, that's good. But then he says right away, tomorrow go out and face them for the Lord is with you. And so what did they do? They had a night. I don't know if they had a restless night or sleepless night or I don't know what kind of night they had. But it says in verse 20, in the morning... They went down to go out to the wilderness of Tekoa. Uh, th this will be important here because uh, uh, if you look on the map where Tekoa is, Tekoa is actually uh, south of Jerusalem. So you go from Jerusalem here, then there's Bethlehem, then there's, the, uh, then there's Tekoa. It's not that far away. Uh, and that, from that area, you go... Uh, east now, and that brings you into the uh, strongholds of Engedi and by the Dead Sea. That's where they, that's where they were over there, okay? So uh, they're not in Jerusalem, okay? Uh, they're standing there in the wilderness, and this is what happens. Back to, let's go back um, to 18. Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat fell low with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell face down before the Lord and worshipped him. Good thing to do when you got that size of enemy against you. Verse 19. Then the Levites, from the sons of the Kohathites, the sons of descendants of Korah, 
and the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel, shouting loudly. So there's something about the shouts of God's people. And it was the sons of Korah leading into the shouts of praise and worship unto God. Uh, our praise is, is, uh, sometimes can be a bit puny. And, and that's why we need to collectively pray. And collectively call out to God. Collectively sing. Collectively do that. And they gave a loud shout and they did. So that's just a bit of the background about on the past historically. And by the way, you can read the rest of the story. It's, it's an amazing story of how God took care. He sorted the problem. He, he cleaned their wagon, as we say. He cleaned them up. Good. Uh, but it comes with faith. Okay? It comes with faith. And sometimes you may be facing something and, um, and God says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it tomorrow. And if you're like me and say, thanks God, but how about taking care of it now? <laughs> I want to be able to sleep tonight. I want a good night's rest. He says, tomorrow I'll sort it out for you. And uh, sometimes God does take his time, but God has his time. And we have to relax in his time. In the meantime, what do we do? We do exactly what Psalm 48 says. And this is a song of praise, a song of worship. And it starts off uh, with, it's a call to praise. Verse 1, take a look at it. We're back in our psalm. The Lord is great and highly to be praised. It, that, that's, a, that's a declaration. It's a statement. They would start off by singing that. And a lot of the songs that we sing often have that. Or the word of hallelujah or praise the Lord that comes in there. It, it's a declaration, it's a statement of the greatness of God. And by doing that, what we do is we take our eyes off of our problems and our circumstances and look to God for his goodness. Now, even if something good happened, okay? Let's say God blesses you and good things happen. This is also important so that we don't look at the gifts of God, but we look at the giver of all gifts. And so we don't get them confused. God, and, and I think, Pastor Vett, you prayed that, that we, we, we seek the face of God, not just the hand of God. Thank you. That's so important. We must see his face, his glory, and what he is. And that's, that's how the psalm starts off. In fact, a lot of psalm, psalms start off with the, a, a declaration to be praised. Now, the Lord is great. That's what it says here. The Lord is great. And you might say, well, yeah, we know that. Well, it has to be taught over and over again. Okay? This, is, this is a repeated. This is why theology, and when we study theology, we, we, uh, we, we look at the scriptures and we read the scriptures. Uh, repetition is the best teacher. Say it over and over again. Say truth over and over again. Why? Because in life, there's all kinds of lies that come over and over again. So much distruth, non-truth, or subtle uh, uh, deviances from the truth. And therefore, it's important to know the truth. And what is the truth? Our God is great. Yes. And he's worthy to be praised. Yes. And we have to remind ourselves, of, and also do that and practice on And as we do that, it gets our eyes off of the circumstances around us back onto God. And what that does then is that the praise comes from the heart, regardless of the circumstances. Now, we've all been in circumstances where that's happened before. We've been in times where... You just looked at something, you just can't figure out how is this going to be resolved. It's, it's not possible. All you have to do is stop. Stop what you're doing and, and remind yourself of some basic theology. Here's some basic theology. The Lord is great and highly to be praised. And uh, just as King Jehoshaphat had to find out, and he had the choirs there re-emphasize the truth, uh, take the eyes off the enemy and look at God and his greatness. And then things come back into perspective that is happening there. Well, let's move on here because the verse continues with something interesting. It says here, highly to be praised in the city of our God. So the second part of this first verse and continuing on with verse 2, which reads, Beautiful in loftiness, the joy of the whole earth, like the peaks of Zaphon is Mount Zion. Uh, the city of the great king. Now, you remember the song that we sang earlier, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful situ for situation, the joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of our great king? Uh, that's the King James Version. That's how they, they get that. Okay, now let's take a look at this a little bit closer. I'm not sure how it says it in your English translation. But there's a few things that come up with. It says, um, 
This is the city of our God. Um, what city? Now, I, I, here, here's a bit of a principle we need to understand about Psalms. Because you and I are living as New Testament believers. Okay? This is very important. We, if, if we miss this, we've missed the point. Because what will happen then is we will look at Psalm 48 and so many other Psalms. When it talks about the city, when it talks about Jerusalem, or all of this, and our minds will be thinking in terms of its original context. Now, in its original context, it was talking about the city there, which is a few hundred miles from here, a piece of land here on this uh, desert, on the other side of this desert. It's there. But that's, that's its original context. But the New Testament helps us understand that. Because we are not Old Testament covenant people. We are New Testament believers, correct? That Jesus came to fulfill the law. Doesn't mean the law gets thrown and crumpled away. No, he came, comes to fulfill it. And he comes to explain it. And all the things that are in the Old Testament point towards something. Jesus is there already uh, talked about in the garden. Jesus is the beginning and the end. The Alpha, the Omega. Okay? Everything points towards Jesus. And then he reve he's revealed. Okay? And then revered. And he's the coming king as well. So when we look at this, we have to understand what then is the city of our God? What does this mean here? Well, in its time, there's a few things I want to look at. Number one, uh, let's look at the, the concept of elevation. It talks about here, <clears throat> in the second half of, of 1 and in verse 2, uh, it talks about beautiful in loftiness or in its elevation. Now, Jerusalem, depending on where you're standing, is, is on a high spot, okay? And so especially those coming up from Jericho would be making up the long uh, trek uphill to come to the city, and it would be a spot where they can see the heights, and it was Mount Zion. This is the same place where Abraham offered up his son um, Isaac on, this, on Mount, Mount Moriah. Uh, where David later conquered after seven years of having his capital over in Hebron. He makes this his capital, and, uh, ha and had stayed the capital there. But it, it is pointing towards something else. And so if we look at, first of all, the concept of elevation, um, we have to understand that, number one, the New Testament church is actually the Jerusalem. Okay, We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. So when we're talking about the city of God, we're talking about the dwelling of God. Where does God dwell? Now, even in the Old Testament, if you read it clearly, God made it clear. Listen, God said, you know, because David was all a bit disturbed because he was such an aggressive man and a progressive man and a, and a go-getter. And, uh, you know, he really wanted to build God a temple. He, he did so many exploits and, and conquered so many lands, but God says, you've got too much blood on your hands, I'll leave it for your son. But he really wanted to do that. And what was his heart? He says, I want, I want my God to have a nice place. They, they've watched it with other nations. He would conquer other people, and they would have you know, temples for their gods. He says, why? And then so God makes it clear, and he makes it clear so many times in the Old Testament. God says, I don't need your buildings. I, I don't live in tents made by men. God made the universe. No matter how nice of a palace we make, no matter how nice of a temple, it's all rubbish to God anyways. I mean, heaven, they, they use gold for asphalt on the streets. It's worth, it's nothing. It's, just, it's, it's, it's available. But in the New Testament, where does he live? Here, in our hearts. He wants to dwell inside of us. The city of God represents the dwelling place of God, God's capital where he has the, where from, from which place he rules and he reigns and he calls the shots and orders are gone out and orders are followed and things begin to happen and the whole nation is mobilized from the heart of God. Well, for our personal lives, it comes from here. But if you follow this through in the New Testament, that's the church. And the church is the revealed uh, manifestation of God's wisdom. We are that new Jerusalem. And so the first thing, uh, we'll, we'll get to that, but here when it talks about elevation, please turn with me to, to Ephesians 2.6. And we've got to see this here, where, where we are. Because sometimes we, we can do the same thing 
that, that uh, the people did back then. They got stuck on visible, tangible things that they forgot that God doesn't actually dwell in buildings. He dwells in the hearts of people. And that our hearts should be focused in on him and him only. And so in Ephesians, which, which is a, a city which had uh, this temple of Di Diana, and, uh, and, and uh, it, was a, it was a city with a religion which focused on the heavenly beings. And they had this understanding of the heavenly beings. Now, of course, it was demonic. And it had a lot of witchcraft, and they had a lot of statues and so forth for this uh, 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 Artemis, the name Diana, Artemis. Um, and, and so they were conscious of the spirit world. And it's in Ephesians that Paul says many times, in the heavenly realms, that phrase. It's the only place it comes up. He says it in the New Testament. And he's talking about we have dominion, we have a power in the heavenly re realms. And uh, what he says, he says something actually very interesting in chapter 2, in verse 6. He says... He, Christ, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens or in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That's where we are seated. We are positionally seated. And so when I sing this psalm, Psalm 48, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. I trust as New Testament believers we do not default to a chunk of real estate here on the Arabic Peninsula. Our, our minds shouldn't go there. That was back then. In the city of our God, it's God dwelling among his people. God dwelling among his church. God dwelling among you and I when we come to him. And where are we? We see each other here. But we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. He has actually taken us and elevated us to that place. This is amazing. I mean, David thought he was doing God a favor by bringing in the, the ark and bringing it finally into Jerusalem and putting up this tent and doing it. And for them, that's all they knew because you have to remember they were under the law. Okay? That's what they lived under. They didn't understand the whole thing, what we understand. Jesus wasn't yet revealed. And so he was trying to do this as best as he could to show the people that God's presence has come. Well, we have much greater revelation than that. His presence has come. And we know that by the fact that we are born again and his spirit convicts us. It's his spirit that convicts us. He has come and he lives inside of every one of us. And so when we read this psalm as New Testament believers, we recognize that God dwells among his people. And when the people gather together in this uh, beautiful city, Colossians 3.1 also says that. Just turn a few pages over. In Colossians 3.1, it says here, For you have been raised with Christ. Therefore seek the things that are above where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your, things, uh, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. We have died to self, and we've been given new life in Christ Jesus, and we are seated with him in the heavenly realms. And so just as in the Old Testament, when they looked at Jerusalem, this was a spot of, of higher elevation. In fact, in fact, all, almost all religions had that. They had the high places, and we know that because this was some of the things that the, all the following kings were fighting against, and the kings that followed the ways of God what would they do? They would take the high places, which were used with the Asherah poles and so forth, which other religions used the high places to worship their gods. The kings who loved God destroyed those idol worship and the places of, that, that were elevated on high. And they would destroy those things because there was only one who was to be worshipped on, on high. Only the city of, at that time, the city of Jerusalem, only in the temple could they come and offer their sacrifices there. No other place could they do that. Come up to Jerusalem. Come up to the temple and worship there. New Testament. We come up to the Father. He takes us and he has seated us in the heavenly realms. Therefore, as Jesus said, we worship him in spirit and in truth. We don't just worship with our mouth. 
or with our intellect. We worship with our spirit. And he has seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. We go to the high places and we worship there. And that's why it's important that no other idol be made. Isn't that the command of God? The second commandment? Thou shalt have no other graven image of any type. You do not bow down to it because there's only one God. And the fact of bowing down by doing bowing down, by falling prostrate, you do that so that the idol stands higher than you. That's what a lot of the religions had. And so God says the same thing. When you come before God, we bow down because he is worthy of all praise. And, and this is the beauty about, about the Christian faith. Yes, we bow down before him. But what does he do? He lifts us up and he draws them to himself. He's not a God who keeps us distant. He's a God who wants to, us to draw near to him. He brings us up into his, his heavenlies and into his presence to do that. So the city of our God talks about elevation, talks about the height. Next thing, it talks about the orientation. Uh, where, where is this? Well, back in our, in our verse 2, it says, it, like the peaks of Zaphon, other translations say, in the far north is Mount Zion. It talks about this, the place of, of being north. And as I mentioned, uh, even with the sons of Korah, as they were worshiping and, and shouting this loud, they were down in, um, in, uh, in the wilderness of Tokia. And if you look on a map, exactly due north, that's where Jerusalem was, uh, when you go along that route. Um, now, historically even that mountain and, and other mountains um, were, were, was, a, was a place when what people referred to they have to remember if you, if you remember your geography the, 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 the fertile crescent or the historical uh, crescent of civilization which would come from uh, Egypt uh, uh, Palestine area where Israel all of that and it would go along the mountain range and come down and actually end up here in Kuwait okay this is where the end of the other uh, fertile or, or this what they call the crescent of civilization was there and it's banked by the mountains of the north and so people have always referred to historically for for uh, millennia have referred to the north as the high places uh, on Wednesday nights, as elders, we're going through a Bible study called Life's Compass. If you haven't yet joined up, you're welcome to join. Sign up, and uh, it's only an hour. Uh, it's, it's based on the, 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 the concept that in life, as we try to navigate our way through and try to find our way through, we need a compass. Now, all compasses are based on north. That's what they're based on. It's a magnetic compass. And the needle in there in the magnetic field draws the, the reader of it to the north. And you can mess it up by having another piece of magnet and holding it to the side, and then the, and then the compass gets veered off. But left on its own, it's going to find north. And now there's a difference between north and true north. <laughs> but the, 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 because of our Earth and its access out... You, Think back to grade whatever it was when you learned this in school and when our earth tilts. But, but we've got the true north which is there and that will always be the direction where if you ever get lost, you can always find that. Why? Because the earth spins around and you'll always know where north is. See, the other stars, if you follow the other stars, they shift, they change. Even in the course of a night, you've all seen the time lapses huh? of the, uh, if someone puts up a camera. But if you show that, the north will always stay there. True north stays there. That's why it's called the true north. And you can guide yourself through wilderness by knowing where the north star is. In life, what's going to be our compass? God. He is our magnetic north. And when we understand the great command, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy mind, and thy strength, and as long as we have that in tune, it's like having our magnet lined up all the time. And if we ever deviate from that, our compass is off, and we will get messed up. We will. But as long as that's in place, it'll happen. And so the whole concept of north and true north and, and finding north, that, those statements, that's, that's all historically there. And uh, so many other religions also have that about this, this idea of, of uh, 
of their gods being in the north. Um, so when, when the psalmists are saying this here, they're talking about the truth of God and the stability of God and the accuracy if we recognize our true bearing in life. God is at the center. That's why he's greatly to be praised. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised because if we focus on him and once you know where true north is, you won't get lost with this at all. Uh, isn't that what Hebrews 12.2 tells us? Hebrews 12, 2, it's a, it's a verse after talking about all these heroes of faith. And what was the whole uh, testimony of the of the story of Hebrews 11? Is the fact that all of these people kept their faith. Nothing they could see with their eyes. Abraham got a promise. He was just a couple hundred kilometers from here when God called his dad and him. And they traveled all the way. And he gets up to Haran. Gets hung up there for a while, and God calls him again. Hey, get out of there. Where am I? Where, where, Lord, where are you taking me? Don't worry about it. Just come. <laughs> he never found the place. Lived in tents his whole life. All of these people in Hebrews, their, their life was a life of following by faith. They had this inner compass that God was guiding them. They believed it, and they took a hold of it. God will lead me. And they believed, and they just went. Don't worry about what you see or what you hear. Listen to God. And then in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it, it now fulfills it for us because they're saying that's the Old Testament. It says, um, because now we have these great cloud of witnesses, let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. And this is what we must do. And they did that in the Old Testament. They would come, and they would come to a particular place in the temple, uh, and, and they would go to the high place and, and recognize the, um, uh, the, the beauty of God there. But, but, but that was passing. It was temporary. But the ones who had it in their heart, not from the external, but from the internal, those ones God recognized as having faith. And that's what the whole chapter of 11 is about. There's a third thing that happens here after elevation or orientation. Then comes revelation, something else that happens here. Now, this is what I talked about earlier. What is this city, this whole city, what we talked about? Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in his holy mountain, beautiful in loftiness, beautiful in its height. The joy of the whole earth is the peaks of Zaphon in the far north, is Mount Zion, uh, the city of our great king. Revelation, please turn with me to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11 and starting with verse 15. So here now the seventh angel blows its trumpet. And there was a loud voice in the heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Pause for a minute. That's what the people in the nation of Israel also wanted. They wanted a city. They wanted a capital city. They wanted a temple. They wanted a place where they knew there's a central, um, the central control system, the headquarters, the place where all... Um, uh, uh, governance and finance and, and uh, all of that takes place. Okay? It, it provides security for them. Well, we've got something a whole lot better than that. A whole lot better. So the seventh trumpet blows. Kingdom of worlds have come, become the kingdoms uh, of our Lord and his Christ. 24 elders, verse 16, who were seated before God in the thrones fell face down and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God, the Almighty who is and was and because you have taken your great power, you have begun to reign. The nations were angry. Note this here because you can, it comes up again in Psalm 48. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged, etc., etc. Um, verse 19, then the temple of God in heaven was open, and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, etc., etc. Great commotion that happened there. 
It, it, it's this progressive revelation taking us from the Old Testament into the New Testament. What did all this stuff mean? And what was it? Now turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. And looking at verse 9. Then one of the seven angels who had held the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and spoke with me. Come and I will show you the bride the wife of the Lamb. And then he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. How? Arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like crystal precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. The city had high walls, etc. We read on and on. You can read this at home here. Connect this here with verse 9. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And so can you imagine John in seeing this? And this angel comes. I'm going to show you the bride of Christ. Now all along. Right? It's been referred to as the church as the bride of Christ. And with anticipation, we would think, as I read it, if, if, if you just read it the first time, come, I'll show you the bride. You, we think when we look up to heaven, we're going to see, as we see so traditional, a, a, a beautiful lady with full dressed white gown flowing. And what does he see? A city. <laughs> Sees a city. That's what they've been talking about all along. The dwelling place of God. Isn't this what was already prophesied about in the garden? This picture? On Wednesday nights we're working this through. God made Adam. But no suitable help meet was found for him. So he puts him to sleep. Opens up his side. Takes out a rib. And makes the woman. He wakes up. God brings her to him. And he says, alas. Bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. And therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. And cleave to his wife. And the two shall become one. God's presence dwells inside of us. He wants us to live. And there's multiple pictures. There's the picture of the bride. There's the picture of the city. There's, there's so many different pictures. It's the body of Christ. Lots of pictures that are given to us, starting in the Old Testament, into the New Testament. And they culminate here to show us that God's design for you and for me is a fulfillment of John 17, 3. This is eternal life that you may know God, to know him. And just like a, a, a bride and a groom get to know each other once they, uh, once they are married, know in the fullest sense, emotionally, intellectually, sexually, uh, relationally, every dimension, economically, everything gets melted together. There's a oneness that's there. And this is what Christ is saying. Die to self and live to Christ. It's only by dying to self that we will understand unity with Christ. As long as we have our own plans, our own dreams, our own agendas, the two cannot be one. But he says the two must be one. We dwell, another picture, we dwell in the city of our God. We dwell in safety in this new Jerusalem. We dwell with God's presence there. There's no need for a temple. There's no need for a son. Why? Because God is the Son. The healing for the nations flows out from it. There's a river of life. There are trees that are there, and their fruit is, bears 12 months of, uh, of the year. Fullness is there. And all of this picture, so when we're going back to Psalm 48, that's the picture that's being presented here. All of this fulfilled in with the New Testament. So we're going back now to Psalm uh, 40, 
48 as we wrap this up here. And I, 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 I took the time only on the first three. We can't get into all the rest, but let me summarize the rest here for us. It says here in verse 4, uh, or actually starting with verse 3 through to the end, it talks about the picture there is this fortification. Because of what value is there? Now, you have to think in the Old Testament, old ancient civilizations. If you're, if you're living out in the country, you're, you're living without fortification, okay? Um, and you're, you're open to the enemy's attack. But if you move into the city, in fact, that, that's often what would happen was all the farms in those areas uh, in ancient times, when enemies would come, the people living around the city would just basically drop everything and, and if whatever they can pick, they would take with, but then run into the city, get in the city, and the city gates would close. And then together, they would fight off the enemy until such a time they can go back again and live back in safety. Um, and, and so this whole concept of fortification, reinforcement, is so absolutely necessary. And so when we're singing this song as New Testament believers, okay, we also have to ask ourselves the question, then, then what is our fortification? Uh, for sure, as New Testament believers, we can't be talking about a, a city here in the, in the Middle East. No, God's beyond that. He, he's talking about you and me, okay? Our great God dwelling with us. Well, let's look at this here. It says here, God is known as a stronghold in its citadels. The word stronghold in the Old Testament mostly, in, in fact, almost always in the Old Testament, the word stronghold has positive connotations in its context. God is our stronghold. He's our refuge. He's our tower, etc., etc. In the New Testament, it's only mentioned, I believe, uh, once or twice, uh, negatively, right? Tearing down the strongholds of the enemy. And so sometimes in our, in our charismatic zeal, we, we, sticking only with the New Testament, we, we have allowed the term stronghold to be a negative term because we always think of going to tear down the enemy's stronghold. Well, that's true. You do have to. We do have to do that. And we fight against strongholds that hold people back. There's all kinds of strongholds in people's lives, all kinds of addictions that need to be torn down. Absolutely necessary. But if they're not replaced with positive strongholds, Guess what? The enemy just walk, walks right back in. And if he had one stronghold before, he'll come back with uh, seven others. And your life will be ten times worse off than it was before. And so when we're, as Christians, when we tear down the strongholds of the enemy, we rebuild new strongholds. And that's the picture of Psalm 48, the strongholds of a city, the tower. And, and, they're, and they're positive here. God is known as a stronghold in its citadels. Uh, look, the kings assembled. They advanced together. They looked and froze with fear. They fled in terror. That's a nice picture to have. Uh, and and that, should be, that should be the way we, we live our lives as well. We do not fear what the enemy has, has to say. Isn't that what was promised to us in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8? Wait in Jerusalem. Tarry until you receive power from on high. And the power is not going to be because you're living in some sort of a city with gates and ramports and all the towers and all that kind of stuff. No, when the Spirit of God comes inside of us, He knows how to fortify us. Okay? And it's not physical. It is spiritual. And when our mind and our spirits are relaxed in Christ Jesus, we take authority over the enemy. And just like it says here, the kings assembled and advanced together. They looked and they froze with fear. When unbelievers see... Christians standing strong it should be a fear that comes across them. That's what happened, actually. It happens in the New Testament. The uh, couple found out the hard way. They lied to the Holy Spirit, fell over dead in the church, and what does it say? Great fear fell among the unbelievers because they recognized, don't mess with this God. Okay? There were no gates, no high walls, <laughs> no one keeping them out of church. But people, I tell you, the following Sunday, they would have thought twice, do I go into that church? <laughs> okay. Don't mess with their God. Fortification. We've got tremendous fortification. Um, trembling sees them there. What, it's, it's 2 Timothy 1, uh, seven. we know this. We, uh, uh, For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Um, and this is what's, what, what we are equipped with. The Old Testament looked at the physical things. We look at the spiritual things. When he equips us, he equips us to the good. 
And we do not have a spirit of timidity. Christians are not designed by God to be timid. Just because we're not called to be timid doesn't mean arrogance or being pushy or rude. That's not what that means. It just means don't be timid. We don't have a spirit of timidity. We don't fear things. And that's what all of the Old Testament uh, points towards as well. Wonderful Psalms like Psalm 23. I, I love that. I think someone brought it up just recently. We're going through the Psalms both Fridays and Sundays. And I remember when uh, just reading that through, you know, it's amazing how many times you can, uh, you can read something and it comes new to you. He prepares for me a table in the presence of my enemies. Now, Psalm 48 talks about literal physical enemies coming and they're terrified and so forth. I love Psalm 23 in this phrase. He prepares for me a table. And if you know anything about the Middle East at that time, and it's much like in, in a lot of the undeveloped places. Uh, my wife and I lived in Africa for years. And uh, I remember you, you, you go into some place, and there, there's no refrigerators. There's nothing like that. And so if, if, you, if you ever come unexpected, and the people want to do something very nice, and they're going to make a meal, you know, unlike um, the an urban place where if you have guests and you find out and you're at work and it's five o'clock and you're about to go home and get and you get a phone call and, and your wife says guests are coming we've got nothing in the fridge not no big deal you drive by Lulu's or somewhere and pick up and they got a whole buffet you put it in the foil you go home take it out of the foil put it into dishes and the guests come and they think you have spent hours preparing a meal but no it was there and not quite so in the rural places what do they do Chase the chicken down, chase the goat down, kill the thing, bleed it, skin it. The, the whole thing goes down there. Now, another point being, it takes work. The Lord prepares a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, it's not fast food. You're sitting there and the enemies are looking at you. And you're looking at the enemies. And we're like, God, hurry up with that meal. <laughs> And God's like, I'm taking my time. I'm preparing a feast for you in the presence of your enemies. Okay, and this is what Timothy, uh, Paul was telling Timothy. He has been given a spirit not of timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You're filled with power, filled with love, and a sound mind. Who cares what your enemies are doing? You're relaxed. We're enjoying life. Let the enemies rage. And that's what Psalm 48 says here. Look, the kings assembled, they advanced together. They froze with fear and they fled in terror. Trembling seized them there. Agony like that of a woman in labor. As, as you wrecked the ships of Tarshish with an east wind. Now, they're in the desert, okay? The, the ships of Tarsus is talking about, the word could also be used as a fleet of ships uh, there. And they're talking about the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the point being is that whether enemies come by land or by, by sea, uh, nowadays we add air, uh, not back then, uh, it doesn't matter how the enemy comes or how far away he is. God will sort that out. He'll just, just relax in his presence. This is the fortification we have when we dwell in the city of our God, when we are part of the fellowship of the body of believers, when we're part of the church, the ecclesia, the called out one. Remember, you have to keep that in mind. Revelation 22. Come, I will show you the bride of Christ. What does he see? He sees Jerusalem. Just like the people in the old days felt security in Jerusalem. When we gather together as believers, like we're doing tonight, and we sing songs of praise and of worship, and we have prayer, and we study around the word of God, and we have a lifestyle of, of hearts towards God. This in itself provides security. And we've seen that with people who, who walk away from the fellowship of believers and try to do it on their own. Well, it's like the guys when the enemies are seized, uh, coming against, uh, laying siege against the city. And some guy says, well, I'm, I'm just going to go out of the city walls for a small walk. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> You're gone. Um, Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It doesn't matter what the enemy wants to do. It doesn't matter. The enemy has got horrible plans for each one in this room here tonight. 
horrible plans. He wants to kill, steal, destroy. He wants to ruin havoc. He wants to instill fear. But when you understand you're part of the church, the body of Christ, where God dwells, and we encourage one another in the most holy faith. We build each other up. Yes, and sometimes that means sometimes a little bit of sparks fly here and there. When we encourage one another in the right path. We all need that. And we guide, are guided by the Holy Spirit and by fellow believers walking in this path. We'll find this city. We, we, all of these things that we have here. Well, I, I better not uh, talk anymore. Just read the rest of the passage. Verse 8. Uh, Just as we heard, so we have seen in the city of the Lord of armies, in the city of our God, God will be established forever. Hey, Brother Harry, if you want to come on up and we'll sing that song again. God within your temple. Verse 9. We contemplate your faithful love. Like your name, God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with justice. Mount Zion is glad. Judah's villages rejoice because of your judgments. Go around Zion and circle it. Count its towers. Note its ramparts. Tour its citadels so that you can tell a future generation. This God, our God, forever and ever, he will always lead us. That's our God, isn't it? Leading us, guiding us. He's given us his Holy Spirit. Let us stand up as we uh, sing that song again tonight. And I'm just going to pray. If there's anyone here and you don't know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, stay afterwards. And we'll be glad to introduce Jesus to you. If you have a special need or prayer request, stay behind. We're here as elders. We'd like to talk, talk with you, pray with you, stand with you in prayer. Many answers to prayer. Because this, what we just talked about, is available for each one of us. The security in Christ Jesus. Father, we commend our, commit ourselves to you again. Commend each one here tonight. Lord, that we can sing, great is our God. Great is our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the city of our God, the place where you dwell. And Father, we thank you that you've come. You live inside of our hearts. And we live in the midst of your will. And within that, Lord, there's security. We thank you. So we pray for anyone here tonight who may be going through rough times. Pray in Jesus' name your peace, your comfort, your joy to be established and be firmly rooted in each one of our lives. We bless you and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.